All right. Thank you again for joining us for our second Impact Forum call. We're so pleased to have Meg Harrell from the Bob Woodruff Foundation joining us today. And so I'll let her introduce herself. Um, but for some, uh, some brief background, here's the agenda. We'll walk through, it's very simple. Um, for background on, on Meg, we will be discussing um, a topic with her that I know is constantly on everyone's mind. Um, and that's funding. How do you um, find money to uh, make your programs work? How do you find um, someone to uh, really invest in you and invest in your mission and vision and dream? Um, and so Meg will be talking about this from the perspective of a funder. Um, and I know even though this is not entirely military caregiver specific, um, which is of course the focus of these calls, I think it's an important thing to talk about because it really applies to programs across the board. Um, and at the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, we have a very specific mission. And so communicating that effectively is always a bit of a barrier for us. It's always something that we have to qualify. Um, if people don't know, you know what a military caregiver does, um, you know, we have to figure out a way to make it clear to them. Um, and so uh, I'm really excited to get insight from Meg on how she goes about evaluating programs um, and specifically, you know, what it's like to be on the receiving end of uh, these types of applications. So Meg, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you uh, and let you introduce yourself and, and get right into it. Thank you. So I'm, I'm Meg Harrell. I'm with the Bob Woodruff Foundation, and it's a real pleasure to um, to be the speaker for the Dole Foundation this time around. And I'm awed, I think I see 61 participants. I'm awed that so many people had the time today um, to, to sign on and listen. I'm really looking forward, especially to the discussion part of, of this session. Um, if Laurel, if you wanna go to, there you go. Um, so I wanted to start by explaining what these boots are and they're fundamental to the background of, of my organization because this is a photograph of the actual boots that Bob Woodruff was wearing on January 29, 2006. He was the newly named anchor of the ABC World News Tonight. He was embedded in Iraq with the Army's fourth ID in Taji, Iraq. And he was riding um, with the top half of his body out of the rear half, a rear hatch of an Iraqi tank when they hit an IED. And Bob was severely, severely wounded. Um, he was in a coma for 36 days. He finally came to on March 6th. And looking at these boots, and we use these boots all the time in our materials because they remind us of how incredibly fortunate um, Bob and the entire Woodruff family was um, with his recovery uh, because it really was touch and go. Um, at the time, soon after the incident, um, the, the neurologist scored Bob somewhere between a three and a four on a neurological scale of 15. And they were really not sure that um, he would ever be you know, Bob as his family had known him again. So his experience inspired his family um, especially his, his wife, Lee, um, to put their name behind an effort to ensure that our nation's impacted veterans and service members and caregivers and families have access to the highest level of support and resources that they deserve for as long as they need it. And that personal wish and desire of the Woodruffs became the mission of the Bob Woodruff Foundation. And today, what we do is we support service providers and invest in programs that complement our government's effort to ensure that veterans continue to thrive long after they come home. And when I say that I'm from the Bob Woodruff Foundation, often people sort of, it, something clicks in their memory and they often ask me, oh yes, how is Bob? Um, as though they expect me to say, well, Bob is coping. But actually, Bob runs the ABC News Bureau in China. So Bob has you know, returned to a very active, very rewarding life, um, but he and, and Lee are very much aware that he received 
you know, the best resources um, from the military medicine that he credits to saving his life on the battlefield um, all the way through his recovery and rehabilitation. And they wanna ensure that other veterans and family members um, receive that, that same level of care. Um, they, they chronicled their experience in a book called In an Instant. And I just mention it because I know that, you know, so many of you on, on this call are caregivers or serve caregivers or involved in this space. Um, and I, I think you'll find a story that you can really empathize with if you, you read Lee's account of what she went through. And it may be helpful to some of you. And I don't wanna miss the opportunity either to thank all of you for all that you're doing in this caregiving space, which is so important. Um, our priorities um, will continue to shift at the foundation as we assess the evolving needs of the military veteran landscape. But one area that we will never um, let go of is the caregiving space. Um, because of Lee's experience, uh, that will always remain part of our investment portfolio. And um, by the way, Lee is providing the keynote on, on Friday for those of you who are going down to the, the Rosalind Carter Anniversary Summit. Um, most of what I do is granting to service providers for particular programs. I have only one case where I grant to individuals, but because of the group that you are, I want to take just a minute to mention that um, before I, I jump into the, the rest of my talk about how we select programs to grant to. Um, because of, of Lee and Bob's experience um, with IVF, and she writes about this um, in her book, uh, we have a fund that grants specifically to couples who are um, experiencing fertility challenges due to their military service and we provide a grant to those couples to help fund their IVF program. We started doing this before the VA um, embarked on their current program. Uh, we thought that when the VA was underway that we would probably close this out and hand it over. It appears that we will likely to continue to do this in part because we grant um, to couples with circumstances that the VA might not cover, such as third-party gametes. So I just wanna mention that to you because um, one of our biggest challenges is getting the word out and you know you all are part of the community that might be able to benefit from this and so I want to ensure you you know about that. So now thank you for indulging me on that. I'm going to turn back to um, the, the bulk of my talk which is about our grant making. So the Bob Woodruff Foundation is a public 501c3 and the implication of us being public is that we are both raising funds and then distributing funds to organizations that serve the post 9-11 population. So I um, interact in a space where I have um, constrained resources and I have both donors and grantees. And so that, that sort of lays the landscape, I think, for the comments that I'm going to make. So now turning to our core mission, our central focus is finding, funding, and shaping innovative programs that serve the post 9-11 community of veterans, service members, caregivers, and families. Um, we have a small team that is that we call charitable investments team at the foundation. I lead it and normally I have two grants officers. Um, I currently have one of those desks open, so also a note um, to help me fill that. Uh, if you have or know people that are interested, you know, talk to me offline. Um, I am fundamentally responsible for the grant making decisions at the foundation. And a very important part of my job is staying current on veterans needs, caregivers and families needs, and understanding the services that already exist, both public and private, to address all those needs. Um, given that we have limited financial resources, there's never enough funding to do everything that we would like to do. We place a lot of emphasis on public-private partnership when we're making granting decisions um, to, to really seek synergies um, and interactions and reduce redundancies. So we just announced our fall grant recipients, which you, you might have seen. We had received 170 proposals and we funded 15 organizations. So our fall cycle is the smaller of our two cycles. We have a spring and a fall. So overall for the um, 2017 calendar year, 
we funded roughly 46 of 410 proposals. About 10 to 11% is pretty much where we, we main study. Um, and again, that's why I, I really emphasize public-private partnerships and synergies and interactions between organizations as I look for programs that rise above the others that we're interested in, in supporting. Um, because when I'm you know, able to say yes to 10% of the proposals I receive, um, there's really not any room for me to, to fund any redundancy. So what I do, I'm gonna walk through our, our processes and our different considerations. You know, I start early on by eliminating any programs that are clearly redundant with government resources. Um, even before I start our intensive due diligence process, I'm looking for whether this is already being covered by the VA or Department of Labor or DOD or somebody else out there. And I'll, I'll note here that I do encounter some service providers that have a culture of almost being defiantly redundant um, to the VA. And for them, what I tend to see is that it's a matter of pride. Um, they'll say, you know, we're here because the VA doesn't really care enough about veterans or we're here so that veterans don't have to go to the VA. But I really think of that as old think, um, more perhaps appropriate in the context of the VA of years prior and not today. And again, I, I just can't afford to indulge that, that sort of attitude. Um, before I, I forget, do make notes. I mentioned our two cycles. So our spring cycle will start accepting proposals November 13th. And we'll, we open for proposals until January 10th. But the, we have a two-step process. So what happens is organizations will submit a proposal, which is relatively easy to write. It's brief. And then we review those proposals and invite a subset of the proposals um, back to our process to complete a full application. And those are considerably longer, and require a lot more thought about outcomes and about the risks to their program and how they ameliorate those risks and what their budget specifically will look like. And one thing I, I do wanna emphasize is that we only accept applications until January 17th. So if you do the math, you may note that organizations that wait until the very end of the proposal um, window to submit their proposals have a very limited time to submit their applications, whereas organizations that submit in mid-November have you know, months, essentially, to submit their application. And we do that purposefully because we've noted over the years that if we don't do that, if there's no incentive for organizations to submit their proposal soon, they all wait until the last two days, and then I have 200 proposals to review um, in two days. So it's, it's self-serving, but it also tells me a little bit about the nature of the organization as well, as far as when they, they submit their, their proposals. Um, all proposals that, that we, um, we take, and again, it's an open process for proposals, anybody can submit, but the proposals that we find acceptable must fall within one or, or more of our three core areas. And those three areas are education and employment as number one, rehabilitation and recovery as number two, and quality of life is our third. And sometimes um, programs will look very similar but if between quality of life and rehabilitation and recovery. Um, sometimes the key difference is whether a clinician is involved. If there's a clinician directly involved, then we're more likely to consider something rehabilitation and recovery than, than simply quality of life. Um, the, the other thing I'll note is that we categorize programs based on the effect on the veteran. And this is, it's not a problem if proposals come in and they've noted um, a core area that we would consider incorrect. We're, we can shift a program or a proposal to another core area. We can do that internally. But what we see is that um, sometimes organizations will categorize themselves and describe themselves um, in a way that we wouldn't. So if, for example, it is a training program to increase the number of mental health care providers that are qualified to provide evidence-based therapy to veterans, um, the proposal might come in as an education or employment program, but we would actually consider that rehabilitation and recovery because it's the rehabilitation and recovery of the veteran 
as opposed to the employment of those, those care providers. Um, I'll also note those are, those are wide categories. So within those categories, we have priorities and those priorities shift as we assess the needs every year and as we learn more about the needs of the population. Uh, those three categories haven't changed, but we do um, make little shifts about what we're interested within those, those categories. So for example, this past year, we really were prioritizing evidence-based mental health care. Um, we were also prioritizing addressing legal issues for veterans. And besides making these sorts of substantive priorities or identifying these sorts of substantive priorities, we may also prioritize certain geographic areas, such as those affected by the recent storms, or we might emphasize a particular population. Um, I'm actively right now seeking programs that serve our, our guard and reserves, for example, because we realize that that's a little bit of a, a hole in our portfolio. Um, there are some things that we do not fund, um, just categorically, they're outside of our space. Uh, for example, we do not fund emergency financial assistance. Um, and organizations that primarily exist to, to provide emergency financial assistance. Uh, we also don't fund you know, individual chapters of national organizations. We tend not to fund capital improvements. So there's, there's sort of a, a, a laundry list of things that we just don't fund and sometimes they don't occur to us until somebody asks about them and then we say, oh no, that's, that's outside our, our portfolio. Um, we also have sort of temporary do not fund spaces. So this past year, um, we, for example, noted and publicized that we were not funding equine assisted activities and therapies. And the reason we said that is because we were actively working to learn more about uh, those services. We hosted a convening in August um, in order to learn more about what they are and what they do and how we can tell the best of those programs from others and to discuss the evidence base for them. Um, and, and there's other things that we don't fund because they consistently you know, fail our, our filters, and I'll talk more to you about that. But sometimes the list of what we don't fund is just the, the converse, the complement to what we are looking at, what we are funding. So um, here are some filters that I apply when we receive proposals. And for us, these are yes, no decisions. So if a program doesn't satisfy a filter, um, we, we set it aside. So, you know, filter number one is must serve the post 9-11 population. Now that, that doesn't mean that I will set aside a proposal because they provide, you know, legal services to veterans and if a Vietnam veteran comes to their door, they're not gonna turn them away. But I will turn, you know, set aside proposals that when I look at them, I look on their website, I look at what they're talking about, they're really predominantly geared towards the Vietnam population rather than the post 9-11 population. Um, we also require programs to demonstrate both commitment and access to their target community. They have to know where to find the veterans and they have to have a proven capability to find the veterans or the caregivers or the families. So we encounter very well-meaning organizations that say, this is what I do and I'd also like to do it for veterans, but that's actually a more challenging shift for organizations than I think they, they realize. And so it's something that we look for that they're already doing. Uh, this seems like an obvious one, but I'll list it anyway, because organizations do occasionally fail this. They have to articulate a clear understanding of the issue that they plan to address. So if their specialty is A, but suddenly they'd like to shift gears entirely and do B, um, that's gonna be a, a, you know, that's going to set off some alarms for us. So, you know, I spoke to somebody this week that has developed a network of dentists that serve veterans, and it's really interesting. And she said, but what I'd really like you to fund is this. And it had nothing to do with dental services at all, even though she was a career dentist that had worked to develop this, this network. So for me, that's, that's a concern. Um, we do see cultural competence. So that's, in some ways that's redundant with what I just mentioned, but it's worth highlighting specifically that we really emphasize that these organizations and these care providers need to know this population that, that they're committed to serving. And, and a program or service must be evidence-based or supported by peer-reviewed research. 
And this is where a lot of programs fall short, um, in part because I think sometimes people don't really understand the concept of evidence-based. Um, I'll talk to people that say I've served, you know, 30 veterans and all 30 are doing better now and they don't fully understand that that doesn't actually provide evidence of, of your program. It's good that you weren't harming veterans, but it doesn't actually provide evidence of, of your efficacy. Um, we look for um, programs that have planned and measurable goals and outcomes. So, you know, some organizations are doing really nice things. They're taking veterans and families away for the weekend. Maybe they're skiing, maybe they're camping, but then they, they don't collect any outcomes. Some cases, they don't ever talk to those veterans and those, those families again. So we're, we're really looking for organizations and programs that, that measure and assess what they're doing. We check whether they're collaborating with other community resources and other organizations. Um, again, if they're working in a vacuum, that is much less interesting and appealing to us. Um, we, we want to see that they're seeking the synergy of working with other organizations, that they're good partners, that they interact well with others, that they're passing referrals back and forth. We want them to be an integrated part of the landscape. And then we also, you know, related to that, we want to ensure, as I mentioned before, that they complement the services and resources that our government already provides and that as taxpayers we've already compensated. Um, we look for whether their scale is appropriate. Um, we look for whether they're not necessarily scalable because sometimes there's good reasons for programs not to scale, but we look for whether in that case, if they're not interested in scaling, whether the lessons learned are replicable in other organizations or other locations. And we look to see whether they've planned for their program sustainability. So that is just a, a first list of sort of yes, no questions that I apply to programs. And then coming out of that, that's when uh, my team and I start to really dig in and we apply our, our due diligence assessment. And this is where we look at things like um, but not limited to the percent program spend. So when I pull up their 990, how much of the, the resources that they've spent over the past year are actually applied to the resource, you know, to the, the program that they're providing to this population. Um, we look to see whether they're solvent. So if I pull up a 990 and an organization ended this year and the prior year in the red and their assets only equate to you know, two months of operating expenses to keep the lights on, um, that's concerning to me. I look to see whether they're sustainable. So where has their funding come from before? So if they've um, been existing on, you know, one very large grant that they got three years ago from the executive director's father-in-law, like that's actually, you know, that, that's going to raise flags for me. Uh, I, I do look to see who the other donors are. You know, this is, you know, just as it's a landscape of service providers, it's also a landscape of donors. And so I communicate with my peers to talk about where we're setting our priorities and what we think of different programs and whether programs and service providers have been good partners with, with that foundation or with that, that corporate donor. Um, I look for how much experience they have with a budget similar to what they're asking me for. So if they've um, had several years with revenue in the 50 or $60,000, uh, I would not grant to them, you know, a grant that is three times or even double um, the budget that they've been managing to date. Um, I also look at things like their salaries. So, and, Occasionally organizations will, by the way, black out the salary data in the 990 and decide that as a funder, I, I shouldn't have privy to that. Um, that's, you know, that sets out some concerns for me because as a funder, I think I, I should have access to that information. And I look to see whether, you know, three fourths of the funding that they raised goes to the salary of, you know, the executive director. Um, I look to see even if they have a good percent program spend, whether their compensation for their leadership is you know, reasonable in my mind based on that individual's past experience. And I will be quick to admit that that's a judgment call. 
but I'm less likely to provide a grant to an organization um, who has asked me for $100,000 if their CEO makes $1.8 million and you know, it's an arts organization or you know, another type of service providing organization. Those are, are some of the things that, that I look to see. Uh, I check the, the leadership and assess whether they have expertise that's appropriate to the services that they're providing. I also look at their board, both to see the expertise and gravitas of their board, um, but, but also to note whether it's a professional board. And we will research who the people on the board are. So even if they're if, I was gonna say, even if their names don't match. If I pull up a board and three of the four people have the same last name, like that's, that's immediately something we take note of. But even if there's a board of eight or nine people, we research who those people are. And if we find out that they're all related in one way or another, um, that's something that we will be concerned and wanna know more about. We also look at social media. What's the tone of their interactions? Are they non-political? Are they positive? Um, what's sort of their their outward looking face? So those are those are all things that that we look at um, for proposals before we ask an organization to come back to us with a, a more complete application. So then, when we do receive an application, um, what we do is we evaluate applications against our organizational objectives and. If you, you scanned my bio, you may have noted that you know, most of my career was spent at the RAND Corporation. So I am at heart a researcher. I'm very much a data geek. And when I came to the foundation, one of the things that I started there was what we call multi-objective decision analysis. So it's a, it's a method for evaluating, in this case, um, applications for grants against objectives in a non-emotional way so that we're not making value statements or assessing whether you know service dogs are more important than finding employment instead we're looking at the programs against our list of objectives and this permits me to evaluate either similar programs or in some cases very different programs um, in an objective way and articulate how one program um, scores better than another program on our objectives. And our objectives are things like the strength of the evidence base, um, whether they have a proven ability to measure and monitor their impact, uh, the depth of their impact, how life-changing are their services. Um, again, this is public-private partnerships comes up again here. So it's not just do they have them, but how strong are they? Likewise, um, collaboration with other service providers, not just do they exist, but how collaborative are they? How impressive is their leadership? And if we've worked with them before, how good a partner were they? Did they value our input? Did they provide us well-written reports? Um, on the flip side, did they complain about our decisions? Did they resist the reports? Um, were they difficult to, to reach? So those things all weigh in as we're evaluating programs. And this isn't a, a black box, it's not a prescriptive analysis, but it, it lets us articulate how similar programs compare to one another and respond to these programs about where they fell, um, where they fell short. And by the way, I, I see questions coming in, but I'm a terrible multitasker. So I'm going to keep talking for a minute, and then I'll go back to, to questions, if that's okay. That's fine, Meg. We can open up questions towards the end, and I will read off everyone's. Okay, perfect. Um, so just going back to, to these objectives, um, you know, they, the objectives themselves will probably shift as we set our new strategies and our new priorities for the year. I don't envision that we're gonna throw out all our objectives and get all new objectives, but we may reweight them relative to one another in a different way. So I anticipate that this will be continue to change. Um, but one of the things these objectives also let me do is respond to applicants about how they compared to other programs and how they fell a little bit short if we're not funding them. Um, it also may be worthwhile really quick for me to talk about reasons besides those um, that I don't fund programs. Um, other reasons that besides they just fail the filters or they don't pass due diligence. Um, you know, sometimes programs apply to me, they're not in my portfolio area, 
at all. You know, one that I didn't mention before was medical research. I don't fund medical research. Um, I also may receive an application for a program that's really interesting and exciting, but I've prioritized other programs um, because I will prioritize to make sure I hit certain populations. You know, for example, the caregivers or a geographic location that we've decided to emphasize. I also won't fund programs that are redundant to something I already fund. And this is sometimes counterintuitive to, to people who come to me with proposals or, or applications. Um, because what they'll say is, you fund a program that does this. The analogy I tend to use is paints wagons blue. So you fund a program that paints wagons blue, and I paint wagons blue. Um, will you fund me? And actually for me, that's exactly why I wouldn't fund them is because I already have that in my portfolio. I already have an engaged partnership with somebody doing that. And I'm more interested in a, a diverse portfolio than funding multiple programs that do the same thing, unless there is a significant need and the program that I'm already funding can't meet the capacity of everybody that, that needs that. And you know, evidence-based mental health care, for example, is, is one of those cases where I have more than one partner that is working together to, to try to resolve this. Um, I also am less likely to fund programs that quite frankly don't need my resources. So if a program has recently received a $5 million grant, um, it, it's less, it, they're, they're not going to rank very high in my list of programs if they come to me and ask for another 50000 or another 100000 Quite frankly, they just don't need me as much as some other programs do. Um, but when I get to the end of this process, everyone that submitted either a proposal or a full application receives a letter explaining why the foundation um, chose not to fund them. And not everybody always wants to hear how they fell short. Uh, some of you may have heard me say before, um, some organization, it feels like they'd rather believe that I have like this magic wheel, fortune wheel that I spun and I simply didn't select them. And that the reason I didn't select them is just because it's not fair. Um, they don't always want to hear like how they fell short compared to, to other organizations. Uh, and once I, I do fund organizations, then I'm, I'm really seeking to be a very active partner, not because I presume that I am more expert than the service provider is in what they do, um, but in large part so that I can learn from those individuals and those services, and also so I can help them in various ways that I can that go beyond um, the grant check. Maybe I can connect them with other organizations that I've learned about out there. Um, maybe I can introduce them to some of my peers um, that are also funding. So that's, um, that's really the bulk of how I select funders. I will throw in just a couple of don'ts that may seem really obvious when I say them, but um, my experience proves that it's, it's actually worth um, saying these things. So don't let your, uh, either your proposal or your application threaten us. And by this, I mean proposals that say, if you don't fund me, 47 people will die before April. Um, those actually aren't helpful. Um, don't contact, uh, this, this one still cracks me up. Don't contact Bob Woodruff. Like, dear ABC News, attention Bob Woodruff. I'm doing something very valuable and Meg didn't give me a grant. Um, also not terribly helpful. Um, and finally, don't respond to my explanation by telling me that if I was smarter, I would have funded you. Um, because often what these things do is they just sort of seal the deal for future cycles. Like this, these programs that do those things are not going to be more appealing like next cycle when it comes back around. So I think there I will pause. I know, Laurel, you sent out some um, questions for the providers, and we can discuss those, or we can turn to the, the questions that have, have come in ad hoc. What would you prefer? Yeah, I think, um, well, first of all, if, if I might just, just make a few comments. Um, first of all, thank you so much. I, I know, I'm sure this was helpful for a lot of folks, um, specifically, you know, looking to apply for your, uh, for some funding that you offer. Um, and, and I think for us, you know, the, the Dole Foundation is in a similar place where we both uh, seek funding and 
um, you know, we also we also give it out. And the reason that we do have our Hidden Heroes Fund is is really to help cultivate um, uh, resources and programs in the military and veteran caregiver space that wouldn't exist otherwise. And so um, we love uh, I love hearing your mission and, and you coming right out with that. I think um, that's so important to communicate. Um, because that's something that we're always trying to uh, to communicate as well. Like add the caregiver to your to your uh, funding priorities. Add it to um, you know your program priorities. That kind of thing. Um, and I think that the um, you talking about uh, having programs that are evidence based is so key. And and for those of you who were on our previous impact forum call, we had the wonderful Terry Tanelian um, from Rand talking about how you integrate. Um, evidence and data into your programs. And so what you said about, um, you know, if, if you work with organizations that don't collect outcomes, why aren't you collecting outcomes? That's so important to um, growing the space and, and uh, making sure that you're reacting to, um, to what you need to react to. Um, so why don't we, you know, go forward with the maybe cover the questions to consider. I think, you know, if you want to respond to any of them, um, for those of you on the on the line, um, I will be sending out a survey to, to get your feedback on this. Um, I think these are something, things that, uh, you know, you need to be introspective about that we hope you will take to heart um, because these are things that will help uh, you know, as you seek funding, not just from Meg, but from the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and, um, you know, other organizations as well. I think this, we can look at it from not just, you know, all of the objectives you laid out, Meg, but also from a macro level too. Thanks. So, um, and Laurel, it's so nice to hear somebody else's voice. For those of you who <laughs> haven't done this before, it's sort of like talking to yourself at your desk for half an hour, which feels sort of funny, but um, it's nice to hear a different voice on the line. Um, should I go ahead and, and jump into the, the first of those questions then that's on the screen? Would that make sense? Yeah, let's, let's go through the questions to consider, and then I will go through all of the questions that have come in and, and read them off to you to respond. Okay, fantastic. So the, the first one, and, and I, I knew and should have um, acknowledged that you had um, the amazing Terry Tenelian last time, but I wanted to emphasize not just evaluating and assessing your outcomes, but also articulating it. And, and here's what I mean. I'm looking for leaders from organizations who can actually talk in an intelligently personal way about the findings. So what, what I'll often encounter is people that have like their talking points worked out and they'll say things like there was 76% sleep improvement. But then I'll say, well, I think that's good, but what, is that, what does that mean? And sometimes people will look at me sort of blankly and I'll, I'll ask, well, did 76% of the people that you asked have some in sleep improvement? And if so, like how much and how do you measure that? And what about like the other 24%? Did they get worse or did, you know, everyone improve their sleep by 76%? Like that would be amazing. Except again, how did you measure it? So I'm, I'm looking for a conversation about what you do and how you know it's working. And although I'm looking for real metrics and valid metrics, I'm also looking for somebody that can talk to me about what that means. So if you tell me that, you know, you saw a two point increase on the quality of life scale, I want to know like, well, two out of how many is that, is that a good thing? And what does that really mean? What does that scale tend to measure? What do you know from that metric? Um, and so that, that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking for leadership that can articulate. Because if you're putting these sorts of findings in your proposals, in your applications, in your annual report or your, your public materials, then I, I expect you to be able to talk to them conversationally at a, a cocktail level sort of expertise. And I'll note also, your development person may not know the types answers to the types of questions that I'm going to, to ask. And that's, that's not a poor reflection necessarily on your development person. I would just encourage you to know the audience. So maybe if your development person is going to speak to somebody from a corporation that gives in your space 
but doesn't consider themselves expert, like that's, they can go and they can make a pitch. But sometimes organizations will send their development person to me. And when I ask questions that get them off pitch, um, they, they struggle. And in those cases, it would probably be better for me to talk to their program lead or their executive director, um, maybe in concert with their development person. So be, be thinking not only about how your leadership articulates, but also how your, your outward facing, your development person or other people articulate. Um, the second question, you know, how receptive am I? I sort of, you know, previewed that a minute ago, but I think everybody, you know, myself included, should be asking, you know, do we really want to get better? And then I think one question to, to keep in mind is, you know, do we ever want to be funded by this particular funder or, by the way, um, by anyone that he or she collaborates with? Because word does spread and responding with your emotions um, may feel good at the, in the moment, but it may be really harmful to your, your organization. Um, and there's really just a fine line between that question and the third one, which is how much am I willing to adjust my mission, focus, or approach? Um, because the answer may be you shouldn't adjust your mission, focus, or approach. If you really believe and know that what you're doing is important, that it's authentic, um, and that it's the right way to be doing it for you, maybe you shouldn't shift for a funder. You know, I've, I've seen proposals from organizations that I had to say, you're, you're doing really good work. You're not at a professional level where I might make an investment in you. Um, you know, the fact that your mom, your dad, your aunt, or your board, like that's, that's where you are right now. Um, but maybe that's where you belong. Or I talk to service providers that say, look, I do this part time. I don't want to get any bigger. I don't want to change the way I am. And it's clear that they're doing good things. And in that case, they shouldn't shift. Um, you know, Laurel, you, you raised the issue of whether you should shift mission. You know, lots of times, I think organization service providers just need to accept that maybe it's the wrong funder for them. Um, because if they're following their dream and their passion and doing things that are evidence based and valuable, um, you know, don't shift necessarily for a funder. So, and I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And just, you know, from our perspective, um, we have a very specific focus, of course, at the foundation. And so um, for us, you know, when we uh, opened up our Hidden Heroes Fund last year, um, which we'll be opening again, just FYI to everyone listening um, later this year, um, when we opened it last year, we got a lot of organizations coming in who were doing really, really awesome and cool things um, specifically for veterans. And that's great. It's, it, but to your point, it's not, um, it's not quite our focus. And, and so they, it, it was good to, to chat with some of them and, and talk about, well, does it make sense for you to apply for funding from us um, if you're not going to broaden your mission to include caregivers? And, and I think sometimes you don't need to. I think if you're doing something really well, um, it doesn't make sense to fix something that isn't broken. Um, we have about 16 minutes left, so I want to turn some to some questions. Um, and I'm going to go to our Q&A first. Uh, the first question we have, are the proposals you're discussing for the fall season or in general for the year? Um, so the, I'm going to jump in and answer what I think is the question, because I'm not sure when I was discussing that when they wrote it. But um, on November 13th, we open our proposal cycle again for the spring cycle. So, um, you know, the, the nomenclature is sort of confusing. It's entirely egocentric. But what that means is that we give the grants in the spring, but we start considering the pros proposals for that spring cycle on November 13th. Perfect. Or you can be my judge of whether that made yeah, sense. I think, I think it is. It was, it was back when you were talking about your spring proposals. So I think that that's um, correct. Um, and then we have another one. How do you evaluate percentage spent on program? How do you know apples to apples are being compared when each organization tracks that differently? What percentage is acceptable to the foundation? Um, and I think 
uh, I think what they're um, asking is uh, percentage of overhead versus um, program budget, et cetera. Right. So there, there's really a, a couple of cuts at that. So I look at the 990 and do a very rough um, judgment based on, you know, the two numbers on the bottom of that page that say like program spend and total spend. Um, so that's my first cut. But even if, if that number doesn't meet muster, and I'll talk a minute in a minute about what muster is, but if that number doesn't meet muster, there's no real need to continue further. Um, if it does look initially acceptable, then I do start digging into what they're actually considering program spend and what they're considering programs um, as well through their, their 990 and our, our related research. Uh, we have a, a hard and fast cut at 70%. If organizations come to me with 69% with program spending, um, I have to set those aside. But you know, 71%, it's not a like you're in or you're out. So 71% is not terribly impressive to me. So at the same time, I recognize that organizations also need to invest in themselves and their capabilities. And so I'm not looking for, you know, 97%. Um, there's, there's a lot of gray space there, and it's just part of what we take into consideration. But I do have a hard and fast limit at 70. That's great. Um, turning over to checks, we have some questions in there now. Um, and for those of you, by the way, who have raised your hands, um, if you're able to submit your question in either the chat or the Q&A section, that is best so that I can uh, read what, you, um, what, what your question is. Um, okay, so the next one, you mentioned that you don't fund individual chapters of national organizations. Do you consider regional affiliates of a national organization the same? The difference is that the latter only fundraises for direct services in our region and not funding to be sent back to national, which is what the former does. So I, I'm not sure that I've encountered region applications from regional representatives of a, of a national um, and considered that differently than individual chapters of the national. Um, basically, so, I'll, I'll give an example. One of our longtime partners is Disabled Sports USA, DSUSA, and we grant to them and then they distill our grant to different chapters and we know which chapters our resources flow to. But it doesn't make any sense for me to field proposals from 80 DSUSA chapters. Um, so that's, that's what I mean by that. Um, and you can fill in, you know, VFW or, or other organizations that have lots of individual chapters in, in the same way. Yeah. For, so for um, an organization that has, um, you know, their, their national headquarters that, that does specific programming and um, say then you have the regional chapter who actually fundraises for itself, um, you know, does it make sense still for them to to turn to you potentially um, as, as a uh, fundraising option if, if they're going to be, if, if their national headquarters doesn't disseminate? It, it probably doesn't make sense for them to field, for them to send a proposal directly to me. I would ask that they engage their national. Now, when, when I grant to national organizations, though, I know what they're doing with their, their resources. And so if they have individual chapters, um, that's going to be part of their, their proposal to me. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a case where I'm going to grant to the national, think it's going to the individual service providing chapters, but actually national is going to keep the resources and, and use it themselves. There's, there's more transparency than that in what I'm actually providing funding for and, and where it's going to. Great, thank you. Um, next question, and we touched on this a little bit, um, and before you know, I turn it over to you, I, I have one comment to add to it. Um, does the Bob Woodruff Foundation fund organizations that serve veterans from all eras, including post 9-11, or do they need to serve only post 9-11? Um, and I know you you touched on this a little bit, Meg. Um, I'll add my two cents in uh, as you know a funder as well. We we definitely have um, uh, are are cognizant of the needs of both the pre and post 9/11 caregiver populations. And so uh, for the fund 
uh, for our fund, you know, we do accept programs that serve uh, both and, and we encourage people to submit for both. Um, so that's just uh, from the Elizabeth Dole Foundation's perspective. Um, and then Meg, if you want to clarify anything else around um, the areas of service. Sure. So I, um, this is similar, Laurel, to your, your comments earlier that you, you just have to define your mission. So this is not in any way to undermine or negate the needs of prior era veterans, but you know, the Bob Woodruff Foundation focuses on the post 9-11 community as our mission space. So when an organization comes to me and they clearly serve um, veterans from other eras, then I start asking, well, what, what proportion of the services that you provide are to veterans of other eras? So if it's predominantly post 9-11, but they do also serve some Vietnam veterans, that's likely not to be a problem. If they tell me, well, about 8% of the veterans we serve are post 9-11, um, and I've had those proposals, that's gonna be considerably less appealing to us. Um, but we, we also um, fund programs that can't always predict who's gonna knock on their door. So for example, you know, I, I have a partner that's providing you know, medical legal um, partnership services in a vet center. And so what we were asking before we granted to them were questions like, what typically um, does the population look like? Who are you typically serving? Because we would never want to put her or her colleagues in a position of saying, I'd love to help you, but I can't because the Bob Woodruff Foundation you know, paid for me to be here and therefore I can't help you. Um, but we do want to focus our resources towards um, those programs that, that are more likely to serve post 9-11. Great, thank you. Um, turning back over to the Q&A section because there's a really great question in here. So thank you, Dan, for, for asking this one. Um, it seems that there are often uh, there's often competition um, between non-for-profits uh, seeking funds for the same ideas, programs, or initiatives. Um, have you ever asked a, uh, submitting organizations to partner with one another and resubmit a grant together? Perhaps they have the same idea, um, and they you know uh, could work really well together, but you know they they are. Uh, submitting separately. Have you ever asked for people to do that? I have not. And when you when you start saying that, I start walking this through in my head. So what I'm I'm less likely to know is, you know, I've received a proposal from Cincinnati, and there's another organization in Cincinnati that is also doing this, but that didn't send me a proposal. I'm I'm not always going to have visibility on that. Where I will have more visibility if is somebody comes to me and says, I want to start an organization that convenes veterans and civilians with a theme around recreation. And I'm thinking that maybe we'll meet on Saturday mornings and sometimes we'll go for runs and sometimes we'll go for hikes. Um, that's where I, I start to say like, well, well why, why don't you just call Team Red, White and Blue? You know, right. why don't you place your energies towards an organization that has already invested in this, broken the code, and is successful? So that's, that's what I'm more likely to see and where I'm more likely to be encouraging them to go partner rather than starting anew. Right. But when, uh, and, and when, you know, people are submitting applications uh, though the the if they have partnered or if they're submitting um, alongside a bunch of other organizations who are going to join them in their effort, that's a really good sign, right? That's a good sign. Yes. Awesome. Same for us. <laughs> um, next question: Has your organization made grants to any veteran service organizations? So it, I'm assuming um, because I can see that on the screen, and mm -hmm. they capitalize the V and the S and the O that they mean those organizations that are congressionally identified as VSOs. Um, I, I haven't thought about that before. Um, you know, some come to mind that um, I've partnered with in other ways without necessarily um, providing a grant to them. Um, I don't know, I'd, I'd have to look because I also don't have perfect recollection of 10 years at the foundation since I've 
you know, been here for a year. And I'm certainly aware of recent years, but not necessarily all the way from the start. So I don't know, I'd have to check. Um, if a veteran service organization did apply and, and they met all of your criteria, would you be able to offer them funding? Um, potentially, it would depend what the grant was for. So if it was a um, veteran or family facing service provision, probably. If it is for advocacy um, or other, you know, Capitol Hill activities, then probably not. Um, where some of those organizations that have more of an advocacy focus um, struggle is with the percent program spend requirement. Gotcha. Um, another really great question. Thank you, Faye, for this one. Um, can you provide examples of evidence-based research that your grantees have used? And I'm going to qualify that too and say, um, when you're looking at evidence-based uh, evidence basis for these programs. Um, a lot of times, especially within the military caregiver space, there aren't those studies those um, that have been conducted. And so uh, gathering data and um, following up and, and putting together um, outcomes over the long term, um, does that count as well? Or, or is that um, not in your mind um, as helpful as uh, basing it in research and rooting it in research? So a little bit of both. Um, often what I'm looking for is a program to be able to articulate what is the research, what is the evidence for what they are doing. So it, it may be that there's not research that has, you know, research, you know, them, they haven't been part of rigorous, you know, academic research, but there is research that proves the merit of, um, you know, athletic engagement or physical fitness or um, socialization. Um, so that's, you know, for those sorts of programs. If they're providing something that looks like alternative or complementary medical care, then I'm absolutely going to want an evidence base for their particular services. And so, mm -hmm. If they're providing, you know, clinical mental health care, you know, do they provide, um, you know, prolonged exposure, CPT, do they provide one of the methods that does have an evidence base, um, or are they coming to me with something that doesn't have the same scientific um, and academic, you know, evidence base? Got it. Um, wonderful. So we have just a couple more minutes. Um, I have a few more questions I want to ask. Hopefully we can get through all of them. Um, but the next two are fairly quick. Um, start with this one. Do you have a preference for funding things that could be 100% funded by Bob Woodruff? Or would you like to see other grantors supporting um, the same program? So that is not, um, th that's not a, always the same answer. That was a terrible way to articulate that. But for me, it's, it's always a balance between um, having a, a partnership where I can be interactive and um, supportive of a program and my concern about their sustainability. Um, if for some reason we set our priorities elsewhere, will they go out of business? Will people lose their jobs? Um, so these are always concerns for me and it's it's something that um, that we think about all the time yeah I, I completely agree with that um, okay one uh, second last question penultimate question um, have you decided on your new priorities within the three core areas for the spring grant cycle do you release those um, what can people start to expect so we have not um, established our priorities yet. We do that right as we're opening up our, our proposals. Um, I'm fairly certain that we're gonna co continue to emphasize some of the things that we did last year to include evidence-based mental health care, to include um, the legal needs of veterans. Um, I do, um, I will say that we've begun looking um, harder for programs that do serve the, the guard and reserve, regardless of what um, title they're, they're serving under. Um, so those are likely to continue our, to be our priorities, but we'll also be thinking over the, the course of the next month about where there's, there's gaps that we need to address. 
And I, I should say too that by priorities, it doesn't mean that my entire portfolio addresses those. It's just that once we set a priority, we, you know, I talk about how my tagline is find, fund, and shape. Like we really focus our find efforts to make sure that we have some of those programs in the mix for consideration. Great. Um, last couple questions. Uh, maximum amount of funding you will undertake? I don't know if that's something that you'd like to answer. It's certainly something that, um, you know, for our programs especially, we don't like to to give that limit because we like to see what people, you know, come up with, but I'm um, not sure if you do have a hard and fast answer. So we don't have a hard and fast answer, but um, I, I do know that, that most people are sufficiently savvy to look at our funding amount and sort of divide it by the number of grantees. And if you do that, you know, it'll point to the fact that our, our average grants, you know, are about $100,000. Um, there are some that are considerably larger. There are some, especially for pilot efforts, that are considerably smaller. Um, but it, it doesn't take, you know, magic math to sort of realize that we're, we're not writing, you know, million dollar checks. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think that that about wraps us up. I want to, um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for being our speaker today. Uh, thank you to all of you who um, joined us. I, I just want to offer up any last comments. I think this has been a great blend of learning more about your specific program, but also I've learned a lot of takeaways on, you know, how to engage with funders and what exactly um, you're looking for from people on a macro scale too. Um, so I think maybe closing out with the uh, with the question that always um, comes to my mind, which is. What's the best way to, to get to know you, uh, Meg, and, and to get to know your programs and um, to introduce, uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a small nonprofit, how do I introduce myself to you and, and get myself on your radar? So I'm so glad you asked that, Laurel, because I was trying to make sure I had time at the end to make sure that everybody knows how to reach me. Um, I think hopefully my email was in your materials, Laurel, but if not, we can make sure we get that out. I know um, that, that some of my grantees and partners are amongst the people in the line, and thank you for, for dialing in. Um, the rest of you that I don't know, I would love to get to know more about what you do if you think that you're in my portfolio space. Um, you know, the luxury of a conversation or a personal engagement is tremendous, but I can't always afford that luxury. So do reach out, and if we can schedule time, like that's fabulous, but don't let the fact that um, we can't schedule time preclude you from submitting a proposal, if that makes sense. I don't ever want anybody to not submit a proposal because they couldn't catch me by phone or in person um, beforehand. That's great, and I, I would have to echo it. I think um, for us, it, it's one thing to read um, a very clean and sterile application. Um, where you present sort of your best foot forward. Uh, and it's another to really get to know um, people, you know, where they are, what some of their challenges are in reaching populations and, and why, what motivates them to do the work that they're doing. So I, I have to say, I, I am the same way. I, I like to get to know um, organizations a little bit before seeing them for the first time. Um, I put Meg's email address in the chat feature. Um, I will also, if, Meg's okay with it, include it on our takeaways document. Um, again, thank you so much for all of this. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in a couple more months for our next impact forum call. That's great. Thank you so much for having me and thanks to everybody for your time today and for all that you do in this space. Thank you.